for us. Um, so welcome everybody. Thanks for joining our basic Dragonfly Monitors training for this season. For those who are new to Upper Sugar and the work that we do, the Upper Sugar River Watershed Association is located in, uh, in Wisconsin, in South Central Wisconsin in Dane County. Um, and the mission of the organization is to provide leadership for continuous resource improvement through strategic partnerships that benefit the watershed's land, water, and people. And we meet this mission by doing all sorts of different initiatives throughout the watershed and in counties um, around Dane County, like citizen science programs. We monitor for invasive species. Our invasive species project coordinator does a a load of invasive species management initiatives and we work with farmers to implement conservation techniques and we do a lot of things. I highly recommend checking out our website if you are new to the area or new to Upper Sugar. Um, and Robert is gonna get us kicked off with the training. If you have questions, please feel free to type those into the chat and I will take a peek at that and we'll get to those at the end. Or feel free to just remember them and speak up at the end, we'll have time. So I'm going to pull up our, our presentation and start, start sharing. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Uh, and yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, I'm uh, Robert Bohannon, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm the president of the board of directors of Upper Sugar River Watershed. And then I'm also a scientist and educator at UW-Madison in a, a, a group called uh, WIS Science. And I think, you know, I, I have, uh, all my research throughout my career has at many points connected back to dragonflies. Uh, even as an undergraduate, I was involved in dragonfly studies on a small mountaintop lake in the Southern Appalachians in Eastern Tennessee. And, and that particular lake, one of the things that we were interested in was there were, there were 47 species of dragonflies and damselflies uh, in that very small lake. Uh, and so we spent about a decade uh, trying to understand in such a small environment, how could how could so many different species coexist? And I've uh, now it's kind of come full circle. But what's unique about the research I've been doing, let's say over the last fifteen years, is that it has uh, been situated in in communities and neighborhoods. It's focused a lot on. Uh, urban stormwater retention and detention ponds. We're hoping to uh, expand that into, you know, farm ponds and prairie ponds, naturally occurring ponds, and also uh, hoping to have some people, uh, you know, identify some study sites for observation along streams and rivers, uh, because there are, uh, there are some, uh, one group of dragonflies in particular, club tails, uh, that, that tend to be much more riverine. And, uh, and we really haven't done any monitoring around there. So we're really hoping to expand the types of bodies of water. Uh, but I have, for the last 15 years, in addition to situating research in community I live in, uh, then it's also involved citizen scientists. And I, I feel very, very, it, there's a lot of meaning in doing research with citizen scientists for me. It just, it feels very promising. It feels like the way, you know, we, we could be doing more environmental research, more ecological research uh, and and the approach that we've taken is that uh, no one individual holds the data or the information. Uh, you know, historically, some citizen science research has been that you train a bunch of volunteers, they go collect data for the scientists, they give the data to the scientists, and that's kind of it. Some papers are written and 
grants are won. Uh, but our approach has been that we want to engage people and people help us develop hypotheses. Uh, people become local experts. Uh, I am so delighted at the returning uh, volunteers that we have. I noticed that uh, Cece was on the call and Cece is a neighbor and she's, the last few years, she's learned far more about a pond that is in my neighborhood, in my backyard, than I ever knew. She started seeing species I wasn't seeing. And I think that, you know, that's the approach that I like to take. And as I alluded to uh, at the beginning of the call, it's, it's real encouraging that local communities are beginning to use some of our data, some of the things that we find to inform local policy, to inform local management, to inform local development. And so uh, that's kind of a broad background. If we could go to the next slide, please. And, you know, dragonflies are just amazing, amazing creatures. Uh, and they show up in uh, a lot of Asian poetry, a lot of haiku. Uh, and uh, on, on the left of your screen, you can see, see the dragonfly pondering chrysanthemums, winded summer leaf, uh, dance, oh dragonflies in your world of the setting sun. Uh, and then I, I write some poetry and dragonflies show up in a lot of my poetry and uh, papery wings with tattered tips, yet the dragonfly flies. I was, I was watching a uh, uh, Eastern pond hawk uh, perched on some rushes a few years ago, and I was just noticing the tips of its wings were just really tattered, they were beaten up, because uh, there's a lot of territorial defense. And yet, this dragonfly is there, it's flying, it caught my attention. And so dragonflies remind me of resilience in ecological systems. Uh, next slide, please. So um, maybe you can put this into the chat. Uh, I invite you to take just a couple of minutes and write down three things that you know about dragonflies. And then also write down three things that you hope to learn about dragonflies. And I'll just be quiet for a couple of minutes while you do that. And I'll wait about one more minute. Okay, so I'm seeing uh, uh, 
they uh, eat other pesky bugs. Yes, they and they're uh, both the the naiads or the nymphs, the immature stages, and the adults are just voracious predators, and they're very efficient predators. Uh, and uh, the the larvae or the immatures uh, are completely aquatic. Uh, they uh, and they live in a variety of situations. They they rely on oxygen dissolved in the water. And so one of those earlier questions before we were beginning is they, uh, you know, they can also tell us something about water quality because if a pond is pretty devoid of dissolved oxygen, then we're not going to expect to find many dragonflies. Uh, and uh, let's see, cannibalistic, yes, that they are. Uh, and uh, that sometimes makes me sad for full disclosure. Uh, and, uh, and so some of the, uh, oh, and they're exceptional flyers, uh, very, very strong flyers. Uh, and so a big focus tonight will be to learn how to uh, differentiate uh, different species. Uh, my approach to citizen science training for identification is to, to help you sort of develop and nurture sort of a, a natural skill that, that humans seem to be born with, and that's sorting and classifying. And uh, so tonight we'll focus on some things that you could focus in on. Uh, and then we'll talk some about the particulars of, of Wisconsin uh, species and several things like that. So thank you all for that. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. So one of the things that, that about dragonflies that lends themselves to, to citizen science projects is they're readily observable. Uh, they're large enough to see, uh, many of them are between one and three inches. They're very active flyers. Uh, and we've got an extended season here, uh, really from uh, April uh, after some of our last frost into October. And, and I heard from uh, a couple of people that they weren't seeing many things yet. That's not at all surprising. Uh, what we tend to see earlier in the year about now are, are primarily some of the darners and especially the common green darner. And I saw a question in, in the chat about migration. Probably most of those that we are seeing have been migrating from the Southern US. So not necessarily individuals that have emerged from our ponds, uh, that that will begin to to happen, but uh, the very first species that we tend to see tend to be migrants. Uh, they're I find them charismatic. I mean, I am just mesmerized by them. Uh, I rem one of my earliest memories of dragonflies was this giant dragonfly in a very very bad black and white science fiction movie. I think it was on the early show after school. And I was just mesmerized. Uh, but dragonflies uh, are, are a very, very old group of species and in, in many ways, relatively unchanged. Uh, the dragonflies uh, earlier were, were quite a bit larger. In fact, about the size of a red-tailed hawk. And that was probably because of elevated oxygen levels. Uh, they're very widespread. They've been found on uh, every continent except Antarctica, and it would not surprise me for, for them to be there now uh, and moving there. Uh, the, the species can tell us a whole lot about uh, the environment, habitat, land use, water quality. Uh, we're seeing some signals in some of our data that we think are attributable to uh, climate change. 
especially the recent warming trends. And they're also, we have a manageable number of species to learn. Uh, they're about uh, 3,000 to 3,500, and, and this is dragonflies. I'm not including damselflies in this worldwide, and then about 150 to 175 species in Wisconsin. Uh, we have found in the mid-30s number of species in this area, uh, and they, they do respond to uh, environmental factors that we alluded to. And as an ecologist, I'm exceedingly interested in them because they provide a nice window into a link between uh, the aquatic environment and terrestrial environment. Uh, because the, the naiads, is, as we mentioned, they're, they're wholly aquatic. They spend between one to five years uh, developing from egg to adult. And then the adults are terrestrial. And they, they are often one of the top predators. And some ponds, the dragonfly naiads, are the top predator. Uh, where you have ponds with a lot of amphibians and fish, then they tend to be more of an intermediate predator. Uh, so uh, we can learn a lot about ecology uh, from them, and especially that really critical link between land and water. So the next slide, please. And so here you see uh, a, a typical uh, uh, life cycle. And uh, so we'll start with uh, eggs at about uh, one o'clock uh, on the clock. And so there are a variety of uh, egg laying or oviposition uh, behaviors. Some uh, will actually cut a little incision and in plants and insert eggs into the plants. Others will uh, extrude a mass of eggs. Uh, others will lay eggs singly and, and dip. Uh, the naiad, uh, you see that at uh, about 6 p.m. or 6. I, I don't know if it's a.m. or p.m. on this life cycle schematic. It could be either. Uh, but uh, uh, the naiads, uh, again, are I think they're just amazing. Uh, they they tend to be uh, uh, ambush uh, predators. Uh, they have this amazing lower lip uh, called uh, the labium uh, that often has claws and spikes on it, and it's jointed and they uh, it's heavily musculatured, and so they can snap that out and grab things like zooplankton or uh, uh, lake fly midges, uh, other damselfly, other dragonfly uh, naiads, uh, pretty much anything that is smaller than them that they can catch, they will catch and kill. Uh, their wings begin developing uh, in the, uh, the larval stages. And so you will see it initially just little knobs that then gradually begin to look more and more like wings. And so they have what's often referred to as an incomplete metamorphosis. They don't go through a pupil stage. Uh, that, last, uh, that last larval instar or life stage will crawl out from the pond. And that's where the emergent vegetation, uh, grasses, uh, rushes, sedges, cattails. They need an emergent site where during this very vulnerable life stage, they, they split out of the exoskeleton. The, uh, the adult begins to emerge. It sort of elongates. It puffs itself out, uh, pumps the wings out, and then that exoskeleton will need to dry and harden. And uh, in, some, in some species, that stage, it's called the tenoral stage, uh, they, they might look uh, like washed out in color. They might, uh, if you see one flying, it might be a very weak flyer. That stage can last from several hours to a, a, a day or more. Uh, 
And so they, they do need emergent vegetation uh, and they will tend to crawl out of the pond and crawl as far as they need to find some emergent vegetation. The um, shed exoskeleton you see at about nine on the clock is uh, called an exuvium. And we're going to pilot a project this summer where uh, uh, putting in emergent screens into ponds where then we can collect those uh, exuvia that are left behind uh, to get a sense of who is actually living in that pond that's emerging and some more information about the timing. And then the adult, uh, you will often see flying, uh, but then many of them you will see perching. And the mating is very interesting. Uh, they, you will see the male uh, clasping the female with the, uh, the tip of the male's abdomen uh, right behind the head on the thorax. And they will sometimes fly like that uh, and uh, fly in tandem. And that in part is uh, probably evolutionarily to, to help ensure paternity because one of the things that uh, uh, several species of dragonflies can do, the males can actually scoop out the sperm packets from rival males and remove those and insert theirs. Uh, so flying in tandem until uh, the female lays the egg increases the likelihood of paternity. Uh, next slide. And so here's just, uh, again, some information I alluded to. They're very old species. Uh, and, uh, and then historically, they were, they were rather large. Again, the, the size of, uh, you know, something like a red-tailed hawk or a Cooper's hawk, uh, which it is really impressive. <laughs> Next slide. And, and so here's the beginning point for us. And uh, so you can feel free to sort of unmute yourself or if you're more comfortable using the chat. When, when you see this adult dragonfly, what do you notice? Okay, spots on the wings. White abdomen, yeah. Okay, now Maggie, do you want to tell us what that means? They get kind of a waxy coating on the abdomen because the males defend yeah. territory during the hot parts yeah. of the day and that helps them stay cool. Yeah, cool, thank you. So full disclosure, I've never noticed that, so thank you. That's another thing I like about citizen science. So that uh, the first thing that I notice is that white abdomen. Uh, and then I began to notice any kind of patterning on the wings. And those, those two features, the, the abdomen and the patterning on the wing are a good first couple of things that, that we, can, we can look at. Uh, it's the same way that I do bird identification. Uh, I look for patterning on the wings. I look for, for colors, uh, things like that. Uh, and so this one, we've got a white abdomen. We've got uh, some large black markings or spots. Uh, about the middle of the forewing and the hind wing, because some of the wing patterning may just be on the hind wing, some may be on both. And then we also notice some uh, black bars on the forewing and black and white bars on the hind wing. Uh, and then the, the thorax uh, doesn't show a, a lot of color or anything like that. And so this is, and, and very often the things that you'll notice will be descriptive of the common name. This is a common whitetail. 
Uh, and so what we'll do now is we'll take this example of a common whitetail and we'll start to compare it to things that might look similar. And we'll just slowly build up our ability to notice and distinguish, notice and distinguish. So next slide. Uh, so we, we have here, uh, and uh, in this particular dragonfly on the, on the left, it's got a pale colored abdomen, uh, kind of whitish, whitish gray. It's got black and white spots on the wing, but what's different about it compared to the white tail that we just saw? It's not so delicate. Okay, could you say that again, Nadine? Oh. It, the, the wings aren't as as delicate and there's more okay. color, color on the wings. Yeah, so there's more color and and they they don't look quite as wide. Uh I, I appreciate that delicate. Uh, and a different pattern of spotting. And so on this one, if you count the number of black spots, then we've got three on each wing. We've got spots at the base of the wing near the thorax. We've got spots on the tip. And then we've got black spots in the middle. And so this is a 12 spotted skimmer. <laughs> uh, and, and so here we've got two species that initially on first glance, they show some similarity. They're, they're fairly similar in size, and we tend to see them at a lot of the same ponds, but now we can use the wings to begin to differentiate. And then these, uh, uh, the middle and uh, uh, on, the, on the far right, these are damselflies. And what do you notice about damselflies in comparison to the dragonfly? More elongated. More elongated, folded wings. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, slender. The, the abdomen on damselflies tends to look more like a matchstick to me. Uh, and one of the things that you can use to distinguish dragonflies and damselflies is damselflies will hold their wings either folded together above the abdomen or above the abdomen, but slightly spread. And so on the, on the right is a spread wing damselfly. And whereas the dragonflies, the wings are in a horizontal plane. And so damselflies will have wings that tend to be elevated above the abdomen. Very often, like most of the, most of the, most of the damselflies that is the wings will be folded together above the, above the abdomen. So if we could have the next slide. So now, here's, here's the real beginning. So what's the same? And imagine a, a toddler going through and just grouping things that are the same and grouping things that are different. I just spent last week with my three-year-old granddaughter and she's exceptional about this. She's better at this than I am, but we all have this ability to sort and classify. So what's the same, if anything? Shape of the wings. They all have four wings. Okay, yep, the, they all have, uh, a pair of hind wings, a pair of fore wings. The shape, the general shape of the wings. They're they're held in a horizontal plane. What's different? Coloring. Okay. Uh, the so. Each of these has a, a different color abdomen. We've got a dark abdomen on the left, 
white, which you've seen the common white tail, and then uh, relatively clear wings uh, with a, a, a blue body, uh, slightly green thorax uh, in the third one there, and then a red abdomen with a little bit of tint in the wings. Uh, and I did see a question or a comment about uh, females. This summer, we're going to add female dragonfly photos to our field guide. And so uh, we'll also be coming back to that in our in the field training. Uh, the last few years, we, we really focused on males because uh, they, they tend to be more readily observed but the citizen scientists that, that we were seeing, they, uh, they were just seeing females and they were sending photos and they were well ahead of where I thought we would be. Uh, probably in 2022, we will try to add damselflies to this. Uh, I think of us as a uh, little, little organization that could and that tries. And so we just gradually build up uh, resources. So, so here we have abdomens that are all different, uh, body color, uh, and then wings. And so we can begin to then to make comparisons. Uh, yeah, and there are the, the black spots on the wings. Uh, and, and we do have a field guide that we'll be sending out to people and we'll have an example of a field guide page for that. So the next slide, please. And, and so one of the things that that previous slide lets us do is we've, we've developed our field guide around just some common groupings. And so we've got one grouping that tends to be uh, dark colored abdomens, pale or white colored abdomens, uh, then blue abdomens and red abdomens. Now those don't necessarily correspond to uh, the taxonomic groupings, but I think for, for field identification, you know, going out and knowing, okay, here are three dragonflies that I may expect to see that have a white to a pale abdomen. And so we've got the common white tail, uh, which uh, we've seen a, a few times before. We've got the widow skimmer. Uh, one of my grandchildren calls it the little skimmer. Uh, I, there must be something with how I'm pronouncing widow. Uh, and then we've got 12 spotted skimmer. And, so what would you use to distinguish these three? What are some distinguishing features? Like what's different with the widow skimmer compared to the common white tail? The wing patterns. And could you say more about the, yeah, okay. So white on the wings and the widow skimmer has, you may notice has four white markings on each. It's got one white marking on each of the wings and one black mark on each of the wings. Whereas the common white tail, you've only got those little white patches. Uh, and then if we compare the widow skimmer to the 12 spotted skimmer, what do you notice? The wing pattern and the abdomen is a little bit wider. The, the abdomen is a little bit different. And then the wing, yeah, the number of spots. Yeah. So the 12 spotted skimmer, if you count those black spots on the wings, we've got 12 black spots. Uh, and, oh, and someone was saying it, uh, they were seeing a recently emerged widow skimmer. Uh, and so, you know, right now, I would be willing to bet that you've got three species 
that if you went to a body of water and you saw these, I bet you could distinguish those. And again, the whole idea is just to slowly begin to build up a repertoire. Uh, if, you know, if I think about 150 to 175 species in Wisconsin, initially that might feel just completely overwhelming. Even if I think about mid thirties of number of species in this area, that could feel overwhelming. You know, there was one point when I was trying to learn warblers uh, and they were all just little green birds to me. But I just gradually built up a repertoire of here are three or four species I know, and then everything else is different from that. And part of our uh, procedures and protocols is you can take photos and then send those to me or to we've got some groups where we do photo voucher verification and so you know don't be afraid to to not know everything uh it was only about 15 years ago i began to learn adult dragonflies because some of my grad students wanted to do adult dragonfly research <laughs> and i only knew the naiads uh, if you put a late instar naiad in my hand, I could tell you what it was. But if I saw one flying, it was like, oh crap, I don't know. And so I was learning with my grad students. So the next slide. Mm -hmm. So now here's a grouping with uh, red abdomens. And here are three uh, that you might see. And so we've got on the left, the saffron wing meadowhawk. In the middle, we've got a red saddlebags, and on the right, we've got a calico pennant. So all have red to reddish. And one, one thing to note is that in several species, the color will change as the individual ages. And so sometimes reddish species begin to become uh, more brown as as they begin to age uh and so you know don't be surprised by that but uh here we've got three that have uh that show a lot of red on the abdomen and thorax what do you notice that's different wing pattern yeah the wing pattern and yeah, the calico has stripes and spots. So it's got these basal patches. Uh, much The calico pennant has these basal patches on the hind wing or basal spots, much like the red saddlebags. But the calico pennant then has other reddish spots on the wings, whereas the red saddlebags does not. And then what do you notice about the saffron winged meadowhawk? And again, the name is also descriptive. So we don't see the basal spots, we don't see the saddlebags, we don't see the spots, but the wings are tinted. And so some species, the wings will be clear and others they will be tinted and the saffron winged meadowhawk then has a slight orange to saffron colored uh tinting you may also notice that they show up pretty prominently on on the saffron winged meadowhawk those uh narrow orange rectangles near the the tips of the wing uh those can sometimes be used in identification. Uh, we, we don't focus on those, but uh, in some field guides and some information you might be looking at, uh, that could be something to take note of. So could we have the next slide, please? So now we're here, we have a grouping with blue abdomens. So we've we, the first grouping we looked at had white to pale abdomens. Then we had red to reddish abdomens, and now we've got blue abdomens. And the great blue skimmer 
on the far left is one of the larger of the skimmers uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, in fact, we saw this species for the first time last year uh, in our observations. And then the Eastern Pond Hawk is in the middle. And then the Blue Dasher, uh, which is a really, really fun dragonfly to watch, is then on, on the right. And so what do you notice that you could use to distinguish these three? What's different? And the great blue skimmer and eastern pond hawk are really, really similar, aren't they? It, the pond hawk has a white tip, doesn't it, on its abdomen? It it does. Uh, that, it, and we can use that. Uh, it's it's a little it's a little more reliable to look at, and we haven't talked about this. The thorax. So if you look at the thorax where the wings and legs are attached, the great blue skimmer, it's blue. It's the same color as the abdomen. Whereas the Eastern pond hawk, it's greenish. Uh, so you can begin to see some green. And then in the blue dasher, it's got alternating yellow and black stripes. Uh, someone noted uh, the pretty prominent black tip on the blue dasher and and that's also there. But for the, these three, the thing I tend to look for is the, the coloration of the thorax. The, the blue dasher also very often will have kind of smoky tinted wings. Uh, but they, uh, yeah, and, and so there was a question about size. No, these are not the same size. Uh, the great blue skimmer is the largest. Eastern pond hawk uh, is intermediate, and then the blue dasher is smaller. And in the field guide, we have information about the size on those. And that's something that uh, when we go out into the field, we'll, we'll also uh, begin to look at. Uh, size initially is, was, was challenging for me. Uh, I don't have like a mental algorithm running of, oh, that's like two to two and a half inches, or that's one to one and a half. I have sort of small, medium, and large. Uh, <laughs> and so I tend to focus more on coloration. And then I think somebody also referred to behavior. I use behavior a lot, uh, both their flight behavior. Some dragonflies tend to perch more. Blue dashers are one that will perch more. And they'll do leading uh, little feeding forays away from a perch, kind of like a, a flycatcher bird. Uh, Eastern pond hawks do a lot of real aggressive patrolling of the margin of the pond. So, uh, so we'll also use behavior as, as a tool. And then the next slide, Hannah. And so here we've got brown to black abdomens. And so again, here are uh, you know four groupings, and the far left is one that is relatively uncommon, though we have observed it. Uh, and it's the black meadow hawk. Then we've got a beaver pond basket tail, and then just to really help you hone your observation skills. I've got another basket tail. And so the two basket tails are pretty closely related and are kind of difficult to distinguish. And so what do you notice that's different about those? Yeah. Yeah, and so Adam Adam mentioned uh, the uh, the black patches on the on the hind wings uh, at the base of the wings, and they're they're kind of triangular in shape, and the beaver pond basket tail doesn't have those, and so when you see 
this sort of brownish dragonfly flying around that's got some yellow to gold colored spots along the sides of the abdomen, then you're gonna know that that's a common basket tail. And if you don't see those spots, then it's going to be a beaver pond basket tail. The other basket tail that we have in the area is a prince basket tail. It showed up last year in our studies for the first time and it's huge. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's very, very striking and a thinner abdomen. Uh, and then let's see, somebody asked about head color. We do use head color, uh, eye color especially. So we will sometimes use the eye color because they've got large compound eyes uh, that have wraparound vision. It's really, really difficult to sneak up on a dragonfly. Uh, <laughs> and then also the face. And I think the next slide maybe shows the face. So if we could move, yeah. So another grouping that we have are the white faces. And so you can see on all three of these, sort of the front part of the face below the eyes is white. And we've got dot-tailed white face on the far left, frosted white face, and then white face meadowhawk. The white face meadowhawk is the most distinctive. It's red. Uh, meadowhawks, by the way, also tend to be a late season flyer. So they'll start flying later in July and August. Uh, but what do you see that you could use to distinguish between the dot-tailed white face and the frosted white face? The abdomen is a lot different. Yeah, and could you, could you say more about how it's different? Well, yeah. The dot tail it just has one little dot on um, yeah. the yellow dot yeah. on it. And, and Timothy also noticed that. Uh, so if you look on the dot tailed white face uh, in the, uh, the posterior third of the top, the dorsal part of the abdomen, it's got a little yellow dot. And so again, it, the name is descriptive. It's a dot tailed white face. This dot-tail white face also tend to be uh, fairly small, only about an inch or, or less in total body length. And then the frosted white face has a, a patch that almost looks like it's got frost in the anterior half of, of the abdomen. Uh, and dot-tail white face brings up a point. I My hypothesis is that there are dot-tail whiteface are more abundant and more common than the data show because they, they tend to perch a lot. Don't see them flying a lot. Uh, they tend to perch on mats of floating vegetation out in the pond. And so I think they're rare just because they're more difficult to see. And so that's also something to bring into sort of your thinking when you're, you're making observations is you know, really learning how to scan and then look, uh, because I, I suspect that we overlook uh, and, and call rare species that are probably more common uh, than our data show. So if we could have the next slide. And then the darners are another group, uh, and these tend to be the largest species. And we've got the common green darner, which is one we'll see flying right now. Uh, these tend to be closer to three inches, tend to be very, very strong, active, fast flyers. Uh, you can very often hear their wings when they fly past you. The, and it's got a prominent green thorax and blue body on the males. Comet darner is one that just showed up the last few years. And it's been primarily a Southern US species, uh, but it's showing up more frequently. And then we've got blue eyed darner in the lower left and Canada darner. And so with the blue eyed and Canada darner, you may notice some stripes on the thorax. And so this is where 
we have some of the darners, they're called mosaics. They're, they're kind of difficult to distinguish. And having uh, binoculars is really, really helpful. So you can determine whether those stripes are straight or whether they have a notch, whether they're both blue. Uh, and then uh, we also, in your notes, you can just add, it was probably a Canada darner, but I'm not sure. Uh, so we do have a catch-all for mosaics, uh, but darners are another grouping that we have. And next slide. And then here's an example from our field guide. So we've got identifying factors. You can see uh, we've got references to the color of the eyes, uh, the colors of the abdomen, the, the body length, and then also the habitat. Uh, you will become familiar with the kinds of dragonflies that you're seeing at your particular observation place. And then we've got similar species to help you. Uh, and so in the emeralds, uh, we have American, racket-tailed, and Williamson that show up at, uh, at our ponds. And so on the field guide, you can see uh, similar species as well. And then you can see the flight season uh, when we observe them flying. And the next slide, please. And so here's some of the kinds of questions that we answer uh, with observations, presence, absence, number of species, most common species, the least common species, all of which provide really useful ecological information. We're trying to improve habitat around ponds, then looking for species changes, noticing which species are more common than others is really useful. And as an ecologist, I tend to focus on long-term ecology. And so I value data over the course of decades. And so what we see one summer, it could just be weather related for that summer, but patterns we begin to see over a period of several years is that becomes a little more useful to look at long-term patterns. So the next slide. And here are just some graphs that we generated from last year's data. Uh, I think uh, showing uh, the, the species at number of ponds. And so we can look at which species did we see at most of the ponds? Which species did we only see at one pond? And then also the, the relative uh, abundance of different species. And so these are all things that we can generate with our data. And the next slide. And here were some spots that we, we used last year. If you have a spot, like I was delighted to see some of you near Belleville, because we have no data near Belleville. That's a part of the watershed that is, I don't really know much of anything about. And so having some observations there will be wonderful. We can provide some recommended monitoring sites. And then also the, the whole idea is to find a spot that's convenient for you that you can get to with some regularity. And uh, so we don't want to have you having to, to drive out to a bunch of different places, but we do have some recommended spots. And the next slide. And then uh, this was a little neighborhood uh, newsletter publication uh, that again, we were using locally collected data by people that live in these neighborhoods to share with their neighborhood associations. And you know, I am hopeful that I can convince my HOA in my neighborhood to then do some uh, a plant restoration around one of our ponds. Because uh, we've got two ponds in our neighborhood, one of which has a prairie buffer and the other does not. And so these are examples of, of data that we can produce, you can write, uh, and we can get it out to 
sort of local municipalities and we can get it out to local neighborhoods. And the next slide. And so here we've got uh, just briefly the uh, procedures are, uh, we encourage you to do an observation uh, about once a week. Uh, some people uh, got real excited and did way, way more observations than I ever anticipated. I'm thinking about UCP. Uh, we record, uh, uh, we tend to focus on days that have light winds, temperatures above 65, uh, which we, we haven't had many of those of, of late, but those tend to be the best days to observe. Uh, we encourage you to vary the time of day because there are some species that tend to fly at sunset. The smoky shadow dragon, and doesn't that sound cool? The smoky shadow dragon is one that tends to fly at dusk. We also measure turbidity uh, or water clarity and then uh, do your observation in the same general area of the pond. And we've been using a 10 minute point count. Just go out and record the species that you see for 10 minutes. And as much as possible, take a photo and then a few representative photos of the pond vegetation along the shore. Next slide. And then uh, again here, we'll go into more depth later but we're gonna add female dragonflies. And part of what we're doing, uh, both to avoid uh, copyrighted photos is uh, looking for publicly available photos, but where possible having the mated pairs. So you can, you can see the male and the, and the female. And so in this particular photo, uh, you have the male on top, and then clasping the female uh, just right behind the head. And so uh, when people observe females, then they can record those observations. And the next slide. And then I alluded to a new emergence study. Uh, here are emergent screens. We just got a couple of poles. These are uh, like rebar and then with window screening stapled to them and put them in at the edge of the pond. Uh, and then once a week, we can go out and you can see that exuvium on the photo on the right, we can pick the exuvia off of that emergent screen once a week. That's something that people can do as an option. Uh, I'm gonna do it at a couple of ponds in, in my neighborhood, uh, but I think it'll be a fun new and informative uh, addition to our study. The other thing I do want to point out is this whole project is conceived as potential for intergenerational. And so uh, I've got a neighborhood group of kids that I take nature walks with uh, each week. Uh, and my grandkids have, have helped collect data. And so it, and last year we had some parent-child groupings. And so it's designed, conceived to be intergenerational. And so I encourage you to do that. And the next slide. Uh, and the field observation record form. Hannah's done a really good job of making, sort of entering the data uh, very accessible and useful. I think the next slide maybe will show that the database uh, that we're using, it's a city, cityside.org and uh, so th there are projects doing monarchs, owls, raptors, all kinds of things that use this site and so this is a place that we're using to to also store our data and I think most importantly to share our data uh, because I want our data to be accessible to uh, you know, other people interested in dragonflies in Wisconsin, like the Wisconsin Dragonfly Society. We've been adding county records to Wisconsin Odonata survey. So uh, the, again, there will be uh, more information about that. And then the next slide. Ah, cool. Well, sorry I went over a little bit. Uh, I have a hard time 
not getting excited about dragonflies. Uh, we will also be sending out, uh, we, the volunteers and I developed a, uh, an FAQ, a dragonfly FAQ that has some of the same information we talked about and then more information that you can review, uh, the field guide, and then we're going to have an in-person socially distanced training uh, in what, about nine days, I think, uh, something like that. Uh, and one of the things that we did last year that we'll, we'll also do is we have weekly dragonfly meetups. And so if you're monitoring a pond in Belleville, one of the weeks we'll get together anyone that's able to come and we'll come to your pond and it's a chance to connect with each other. I think that's especially important coming out of a pandemic, uh, but it's also a chance to practice. Uh, and, you know, so, so don't feel like this training is the only part of your training. Uh, part of your training will also be when you send me a photo and we talk about it when we have a meetup. Uh, so this is really just the beginning. And if you're feeling overwhelmed, I would say don't. If you're feeling excited, I would say yay. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I'm happy to take any other questions for people that want to hang around. Uh, I, I sort of lost track of all the questions going into the chat. Hannah, I hope there's a way that we can uh, document all those. Okay, thank you. There are a few. So one question is, do dragonflies only live around standing water or are they also present along creeks, streams, and rivers? Yeah, thank you. I, uh, so I'm really, really hopeful that some of you will choose to have a monitoring site that's along a, a creek or growing up in Eastern Tennessee, I call them cricks. Uh, and uh, because the club tails and also the uh, snake tails are groups that tend to be more rivery. And we haven't done any monitoring uh, along any streams and rivers. And so we can provide some suggestions uh, if, of, of particular tributaries of interest. I know Fry's Feeder and Donald Park is one I'm really interested in. Uh, Mount Vernon uh, Creek is another, uh, Badger Mill Creek uh, as it goes into the uh, uh, Upper Sugar River uh, is trout habitat. And there are species that are primarily riverine. Uh, the uh, spatter dock darner is one that we expect to find and it's a relatively rare species in Wisconsin. For those of you who have to head out, uh, just a few logistics, like Robert said, we're having an in-person training on Saturday, May 22nd. So we would love for you to attend. You'll get to see how to test the water clarity using our turbidity tube. For those of you who do not yet have a Dragonfly monitoring kit, which includes a, a field guide and a, a turbidity tube, you, will, you can pick that up at the training. Um, what else? So, so I, get, I got some direct messages. Uh, do we allow catch and release uh, netting to ID species? Uh, we don't control that. We don't encourage it. Uh, we've tried to make this uh, uh, primarily observational, uh, especially at the beginnings. Uh, but there are you know, some of those mosaic darners uh, to really confirm some of the ID uh, we will need to have them in hand. And so I would say, uh, you know, we, as a group, we don't encourage it, but we also, you know, if, if you do it, then just do it responsibly. Uh, I, I have tried to sort of get my research to a point where I really don't catch and kill a lot of things. Uh, because I've, uh, you know, the first half of my career, 
I'm hesitant to say how many uh, sunfish I caught and removed from habitats. And so we've tried to configure this for observation, but yeah, certainly. Uh, and the name of the lake in East Tennessee was Bays Mountain Lake. One more question we had um, was, is the present, do we uh, monitor for the presence and absence or do we count numbers? Okay, that's a good question. We've, we've set this up where there are tiers of effort and involvement. And so the, the most basic thing we want are 10 minute point counts. Then for some of you adding turbidity measurements, so we've got measurements of water clarity on the day that you do your observation is useful, uh, but that's not required. So the 10 minute point count is our basic level, then adding turbidity and then estimating relative abundance. Uh, and we've got some protocols to do that. It, it's not trivial to count rapidly moving flying dragonflies but we've got some uh, ways of estimating categorical data and that does become useful. And so we've got tiered monitoring levels, uh, you know, for this summer, another tier will be the emergent study. And then I think next year, another tier would be dragonflies and damselflies. So we've tried to make it accessible and you determine your, your effort. But the, the data that we all collect in common are the 10 minute point counts. The last logistical thing I'll add is for those of you who are unsure how to use the CITESI database, there's a training tutorial on the bottom of that website linked in the chat. Um, and if you have questions, you can feel free to email, email me and I will get you hooked up with an account and how to start logging data. Like Robert said, it is very intuitive but I'm sure you will all pick it up very quickly. You also and have I the option would, of sending me your data and I'll input it for you if you feel overwhelmed. It's up yeah. to you. The, the other thing I would say is uh, for anyone that, you know, wants to email me directly with follow up questions uh, about this, uh, like, you know, uh, Bob and Maggie, I'm really interested in learning more about what you've been doing in Texas. Uh, and so you know, feel free to reach out to me uh, via email with any kind of follow-up questions. Uh, last year, we made really good use, I, th I think effective use of a Upper Sugar River Dragonfly Monitors uh, Facebook page. And there, that was a place where people, uh, people would post a picture and a tentative ID, and then we could crowdsource the identification. And so it became another it became another training tool for us, uh, and uh, so we'll be doing doing that again as well. I think it also created kind of a spirit of competition, and and we do have one little competition in this. It's almost like a dragonfly bio blitz, where we will have a week that we designate, and dragon I've assigned dragonflies different point values. And so then your challenge is to get the most points. And as you might guess, rare species have really high point values. Uh, and so that adds uh, another little fun, fun feature to it. And it's, it's, again, if you've ever participated in a bio blitz, it's kind of our version of a bio blitz. And there are real prizes. Yes. Well, thank you everyone so much. Uh, and it, it's really good to see familiar faces and uh, delighted to see the new faces. And I know that there were some people on the call that aren't in the watershed. And again, that is, that is absolutely fine. Uh, like, uh, you know, we will be primarily using the data from our watershed to share information within the watershed, but I've I've never met a dragonfly from anywhere that I wasn't excited about. <laughs> so, 
We'll stick around well, thanks, if you everyone. have any more questions, but thank you all for being here. It's really good to see your faces. And this is recorded and we'll send you the resources in an email. Robert, not a question, but thank you so much for this. I'll be in contact with you about